tonight we have a really interesting new performance with Stephen Collins giving a lecture on Robert Frost as part of the last, probably, program in our local history series. Um, at the end of the program, I'd really appreciate it if you'd fill out an evaluation form there on the back table that helps us to understand how you feel about the program that you've seen and if you have suggestions for other ones. I'm just going to turn it over to Stephen Collins. All right. <laughs> going out to clean the pasture spring. I'll only stop to rake the leaves away and wait to watch the water clear. I may. I shan't be gone long. You come too. I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young, it totters when she licks it with her tongue. I shan't be gone long. You come to. Robert Frost is the only poet to win the Pulitzer Prize four times. Several poets have won the Pulitzer Prize three times, but nobody four times, and I think that speaks to the length and the breadth and the depth of the career of Robert Frost. He wrote nearly 1,000 poems. His last book of poetry, In the Clearing, was published posthumously six months after he died. Now, a critic once asked him, Robert, do you consider yourself to be a realist? And he looked at the critic and he smiled and he said, no, I consider myself to be an actualist. I write about things that actually <coughs> happened. Now, in that little poem, The Pasture, if he had not spent time on farms in both New Hampshire and Vermont, I don't think he could have picked that perfect word I'm going out to fetch the little calf that's standing by the mother. It's so young, it what? It totters when she licks it with her tongue. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm in Derry, New Hampshire, so I'm very acutely aware that this is where the farm is. And of course, Randy's here, and I bring people up to the farm. I bring groups of seniors all throughout the season. And so probably there's a lot of people here in Derry that know as much about Robert Frost as I think I know. But does anybody know, of course, I know Randy knows, and I know this gentleman knows. You all know where Robert Frost was born? He was born in San Francisco. So before I delve into the poetry, I would like to just talk very, very briefly about how that happens, all right? So his father, William Prescott Frost, was born in Kingston, New Hampshire. And his father had a big job managing the mills in the Lawrence, Massachusetts area, the clothing mills. And so William Prescott Frost was able to go to Harvard University. Now, when he graduated from Harvard, his father had a job essentially waiting for him, a big job in these clothing mills, but he wanted nothing to do with that. He wanted to go west, young man. Now, this is in the early 1870s, so what has happened in California 25 years previous mm. to this. Gold rush. The gold rush, all right? And so a lot of enterprising men are still going out to California and thinking that they're going to make their fortune in the gold rush, all right? So William Prescott Frost tells his father, no, that he's going to go west. And his father says to him, well, you better do this on your dime. This is a ridiculous, foolhardy idea. I do not approve, and you better do it on your own dime. So William Prescott Frost decides that he will work his way across the country slowly if he has to, and that he will eventually get out to San Francisco. Well, one of the jobs he gets hired is to teach at a private school for boys in Lewiston, Pennsylvania. And that is where William Prescott Frost meets Isabel Moody. Now, Isabel Moody was born in Scotland. Her parents died in a tragic accident, and she came here to live with relatives. Isabel Moody was eight years older than William Prescott Frost. Some of her girlfriends were getting a little worried that she was getting along in age, and aren't you interested in getting married? And Isabel Moody once famously said that her life was teaching and education, and she said famously that men were not to be trusted. And maybe she was on to something, <laughs> men here in the audience. But in any event, Isabel Moody and William Prescott Frost fall in love. Now, he works the school year. He saves up his money. At the end of this period of time, he is going to go out. He wants her to come with him. 
And she basically, why would I go and leave my job teaching? You don't know what you're going to do out there. You don't have a job. You're not settled. You go out. You get settled. We can write letters to each other, and we'll see what happens. So he goes out there. He gets a job working as a journalist. He also gets very involved in democratic national politics and becomes a delegate to the convention of 1884, where Grover Cleveland was elected president. He wears down her resistance, and she eventually goes out. So it is there that Robert Frost, and they get married, and it is there out in California in San Francisco that Robert Lee Frost is born on March 26, 1874. Now, his middle name is Lee because William was a copperhead, and copperheads oh. were people that were sympathetic to the Confederacy. Mm. Now, um, what can I say? Uh, at Harvard University, William Prescott Frost went to Harvard. He had a reputation for being something of a heavy drinker, a gambler, and a ladies' man. He was able to keep those bad habits in check, but when young Robert is about a year and a half old, Isabel is pregnant with what will be her second and other only child, Jean Frost. And Isabel is quite concerned. The biographies I've read suggest that William Prescott is not coming home. There's suggestions that maybe he's philandering around and having an affair. Who knows? In any event, she takes young Robert a year and a half in tow, goes clear across the country, knocks on the grandfather's door, who's now living in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and basically, I think, is looking for advice, perhaps a little bit of sympathy, and he, she gets none of that. The grandfather basically says something to the effect, well, he was all right before he met you. This must have something to do with you and be your fault. All right? So she goes back to Lewiston, Pennsylvania. She gives birth to her second child and stays with a friend of hers. Now, most of the first year of Jean Frost's life, she's with Isabel and... William doesn't even see her. He's writing these letters begging her to come back. Basically, after a while, he wears down her resistance and she goes back again. Now, the same pattern plays itself out for a while. He's able to keep his bad habits in check, but then he starts drinking heavily and gambling again. And the point that I want to impress upon you is that the young years of Robert Frost and his sister Jean were hardly idyllic. In fact, they were pretty dysfunctional. And so um, his father dies at age 34 when Robert is 11 years old and Jean is 9 years old. Now, Isabel never wanted to be in San Francisco. There was a life insurance policy, but the life insurance policy has lapsed because he stopped paying premiums. So she takes the family and goes back, knocks on the grandfather's door yet again, this time, I think, out of a sense of familial obligation and responsibility, he takes them in. But Isabel is fiercely independent. I believe she only stays with him for five or six months. And then she gets a job teaching, essentially, in what would be a middle school. All right? So I'm, there's lots I'm leaving out. I just wanted to give you a little thumbnail sketch. Now let's move on to the high school years of Robert Frost. He graduates from Lawrence High School in 1892. And his senior year, he meets a woman named Eleanor White. And Eleanor White and he are both very, very good students academically. And Robert is also athletically a very good athlete. He plays both <laughs> baseball and football. Their senior year, they are <coughs> neck and neck for top high academic honors. So when it comes time for the principal to decide who's going to be the class valedictorian, he's got a tough choice. So he decides to make them co-valedictorians. So Robert Frost and Eleanor White are co-valedictorians of the Lawrence High School class of 1892. Now, they were on the school magazine and newspaper together. She was a budding poet herself. And they fell in love, and they promised themselves to each other. And in the biographies I've read, it suggested Frost bought her some very cheesy, cheap ring and, <laughs> and gave it to her. But in any event, she goes off to St. Lawrence College in upstate New York, and he goes to Dartmouth. 
And one of the reasons he goes to Dartmouth is that the grandfather, William's father, Robert's grandfather, thinks that some of his son's problems probably had to do with Harvard University. So instead he goes to Dartmouth. Now he lasts at Dartmouth College for all of about three months. And he writes letters to some of his high school friends, particularly his friend Carl Burrell, who was several years older than him, but was held back when he was in middle school or grammar school. And Carl Burrell will eventually play an important part in Frost's life because he will essentially manage the dairy farm. So he writes all these letters saying that he resents people telling him what to read and when to read it. And furthermore, he says that most of his professors are dolts. Now, the, the hard part I have reading the biographies, and I've read most of the Frost biographies, is that he was such a brilliant academic student. It seems that he was not emotionally ready for the rigorous demands of college. And I think in a lot of ways, I think Robert Frost is a classic example of a late bloomer, late bloomer. Now, another reason he may have given himself permission to drop out of Dartmouth is by this point in time, his mother had left the middle school where she was teaching and she opened her own school. It was not unusual for enterprising women back in those days to open their own school. And so this is Frost's first teaching experience. And she's having trouble disciplining the 12, 13, and 14-year-old boys. So Frost goes along, and apparently he does a pretty good job whipping them into shape. Although there is a story in the biographies that um, several of them waited for him one day and apparently beat him up a little bit and knocked him, <laughs> knocked him around. But in any event, Frost teaches in the school. Now, during this time, he's writing Eleanor letters and begging her to come and teach in the school. But to her credit, she sticks it out and she gets her education at St. Lawrence College. So now let's fast forward again a little bit because I do want to get to the poetry as quickly as possible. So Frost begins to develop some medical issues. And doctors think that, you know, maybe because his father died of tuberculosis and probably also complications from alcoholism, that it would be best for him to be doing something outdoors. So by this point in time, I believe he's about 23, 24 years old. And Eleanor sees a piece of property, the dairy farm up the street, on the market for $1,700. And she goes to the grandfather and asks him about helping them out. And the grandfather uh, is a little bit cold to the idea at first, but he talks to Frost and he says to him, listen, I know you have pretensions and ideas about being a poet. You have to promise me that if you're not a published poet in two to three years, that you will totally devote your energies to the farm. And Robert knows how to yes his grandfather, so he says all of the right things. Now, all the biographies I've read suggest, and Frost even said it, he was never really a farmer. Thank the Lord he hired Carl Burrell to manage the farm, because Frost also said that he wrote some of his best poetry between 10 o'clock and 1 o'clock in the morning. He was a very nocturnal person. Now, if you are a nocturnal person, that doesn't bode well if you're trying to be a farmer, right? And of course, there is the funny story about how he tried to get the cows onto his schedule. And I know you tell that, <laughs> Randy, at the farm all the time. But in any event, Frost, Frost was really leaving it all up to Carl Burrell. Now, during those 11 years on the dairy farm, that's when most, most critics believe that Robert Frost really honed his poetical skills. And there's a very funny story in the biographies also of him spending a lot of time on the party line telephone. And Eleanor would come in and she'd be aghast and she'd say, Robert Frost, what are you doing on that phone? Why do you want to listen to people's gossip? And he would say, darling, I'm not interested in gossip. I'm just interested in listening to the way my neighbors use the language, the intonations of this Yankee sound up here. Now, um, we know that he submitted lots and lots of poems for publication, and he has a stack of rejection letters probably that thick. 
Now, one of the poems, the first poem we're going to look at here tonight, Tuft of Flowers, all right, that poem was actually published in a magazine called The Independent, The Independent Magazine. It was seen by a man by the name of Robert Miriam. Robert Miriam was on the board of directors of Pinkerton Academy. And Robert Miriam sought out Robert Frost. And he said to him, I want you to teach at Pinkerton. Now, Frost doesn't really want to teach. Carl Burrell is managing the farm. He spends a lot of time walking and writing his poetry, and he doesn't want to teach. But Eleanor gets wind of this, and she basically says, listen, Carl's managing the farm. It's making some profit and some money, but we could use the cash flow. I think you should take the job. So Frost starts teaching at Pinkerton Academy, I believe, in 1906 or 1907, one of those two years. In any event, all the accounts I've read indicate that his students absolutely loved him. He jumped into directing plays. We know that he directed Midsummer Night's Dream. We know that he directed some plays by William Butler Yeats. And his students loved him. They loved him to the fact that the head of secondary education for public schools in New Hampshire came to watch him teach because word got out there that he was such a great teacher. Well, eventually, the president of Pinkerton Academy got a job at Plymouth State College, and he wanted Frost to come with him because he recognized how wonderful a teacher he was. Now, Frost is kind of settled in at Pinkerton and is rather enjoying it. So he says to this man, well, you know, I don't know, I, I kind of like teaching here, and well, I don't know, tell me what's open in the English department. And the fellow looks at him and says, well, that's the problem. Right now, there's nothing open in the English department. But there is something open in the psychology department. <laughs> and Frost says to him, well, I don't know a goddamn thing about psychology. And he says, well, nobody else does either. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, so Frost goes to Plymouth State College, teaches, I think, a semester of psychology. And then it opens up that he is in the English department. Now, eventually, the grandfather dies. All right? The farm is now completely in the hands of Robert and Eleanor. He's 38 years old. All right? He wants to shake things up. One of his students at Pinkerton was a fellow by the name of John Bartlett. John Bartlett had gone out to the Pacific Northwest to Vancouver. And John Bartlett is writing letters to Frost and saying, Robert, you should come out here to the Pacific Northwest I think it would just inspire you as a poet. I think that Eleanor and the children would love it. You should come. So Frost goes to Eleanor and basically says, I think we're going to go to Vancouver. And Eleanor says, listen, Robert, you know, you have your fantasy. I have mine. My fantasy is I want to move to England and live in a thatched cottage. Now, all the biographies I've read are consistent on this fact. They decided to flip a coin. If the coin flip, I forget which way it was, heads or tails, but if the coin flip came up one way, they were going to Vancouver. If the coin flip came up the other way, they were going to England. Obviously, the coin flip came up England, they went to England, and the rest, they say, is history. All right? Now, in England, lots of things happen serendipitously, synchronistically, however you want to put it. He meets an expatriate poet by the name of Ezra Pound. Mm -hmm. Ezra Pound gets him introduced to William Butler Yeats. He gets introduced to the Georgian circle of poets. And Frost is given a letter of introduction to a firm that specializes in publishing poetry. It's called David Nutt and Associates. Frost goes off to David Nutt and Associates, knocks on the door. A woman's voice says, come in. Frost goes in. Ezra Pound says, I should show you my poems, and uh, I should show them to Mr. Nutt. So where's Mr. Nutt? And Mrs. Nutt says, well, he's not here. You'll have to deal with me. And Frost insists that he needs to deal with Mr. Nutt. And she eventually says to him, he's dead. I'm the widow, and I now run this firm. Uh, well, I'm Robert Frost. I'm a poet. Well, a lot of people think they're poets, Mr. Frost. Why don't you leave me what you have, and I'll take a look at them. So he gives her this manuscript which is carefully put together, and it will become, eventually, his first book of poetry called A Boy's Will. The title comes from the Longfellow poem, A Boy's Will is the Wind's Will. 
Well, if she's anything like me, she put the poems down, and then something found its way on top of that, a magazine, a newspaper. In any event, she forgets that these poems are there. Mm. I believe the biographies say a week and a half, two weeks go by. This is the first time he really begins to despair that perhaps he doesn't have the talent that he thinks he has. But in any event, she eventually finds the poems. She's extraordinarily impressed with them. She telegrams him and says, come to my offices immediately. Want to discuss terms for publishing your first book of poetry. The edition gets very good reviews. It sells out. It gets reprinted. It sells out. It gets reprinted again. Mrs. Nutt, now knowing she has a hot literary commodity on her hands, signs a contract with Frost for his next two or three books of poetry, which will eventually become a problem when he comes back to the United States and wants to broker a deal with Henry Holt and Associates. So in any event, the second book of poetry, North of Boston, also gets published by David Nutt over in England. So this quintessential New England poet, Robert Frost, is not born in New England. He's born in San Francisco and spends his first 11 years there. And his first two books of poetry are published not by an American publisher, but by a British publisher. All right, now he probably would have been content to stay in England. But his daughter, Leslie, who I believe was seven years old when they went, is now 10, 10 and a half. They were in England, I think, for just about a month shy of three years. And the Lusitania gets sunk in the North Atlantic, and he thinks that maybe if he doesn't act quickly, that he'll be in trouble. So just as he went over on a whim and impetuously, he leaves on December 22nd, 1915, on a ship called the Parisian. And they get back to the United States and in New York. Now, he's a published poet now. He's doing pretty well. He puts his family up in a pretty nice hotel, and he decides that he's going to walk to the offices of Henry Holt and Associates and broker for himself a deal. As he's walking down, he passes by a magazine stand, and he sees a copy of a magazine called The New Republic. And who's on the cover of The New Republic? Him. And inside, there's a review of his second book of poems, North of Boston. And the review is by Amy Lowell, the great, great, great granddaughter of James Russell Lowell and the first cousin of Robert Lowell, who would win the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry in 1962. Mm -hmm. Now, from the moment Frost gets back, he's 41 and a half years old, the three-volume biography, the official biographer of Frost, Lawrence Thompson, he calls the second installment the Years of Triumph. And really, his career just takes off like a rocket. He's offered a teaching position at Amherst College in 1917, and he's affiliated with Amherst College for really the next 40 years of his life, with a few sabbaticals taken here and there to teach in Michigan and to teach in Florida and some other places. But his career takes off like a rocket. Now, um, as much success as Robert Frost had, and of course he had a huge amount of success, by the late 40s after World War II and all through the 50s, he did what he called his barding around. He was giving readings at all the major colleges in the country, getting paid on the low side $2,000 and on the high side $5,000 a reading. Now think about how much money that was in the 1950s. And you get an idea of how successful financially he was as a poet eventually. Mm. But yet, with all of that success, there's major, major tragedy. The first son, Elliot, dies of infant cholera at the age of three. And of course, in the book, North of Boston, there's a poem that he writes about that. His wife, Eleanor, dies in 1938, I believe she's 61, 62 years old, of a heart attack. Two years later, his son Carol commits suicide, blowing his head off with a shotgun. His daughter Marjorie dies complications from childbirth. His daughter Irma ends up in an insane asylum. And his sister Jean spends the last 15 years of her life in an asylum in Augusta, Maine. 
So lots and lots of tragedy. A medical and, asylum or a uh, like tubercular or, or a no no a, 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 a mental a mental, mental asylum, asylum yes. yes. So um, so there in a nutshell is a little bit of the thumbnail of of Robert Frost and his life. Now I want to dive into the poetry now. So what I want to say is that during those years on the dairy farm, he really honed his skill. And his poetry, he uses a colloquial-based language rather than a rhetorical-based language. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to recite, believe it or not, a Longfellow poem for you first. Now, I like some of Longfellow, um, but I want to illustrate. I want you to listen to the rhythm and cadence of Longfellow, and then I'm going to dive into Tuck the Flowers. And so I just want to see if your ear can distinguish the difference in the cadence, all right? So here's Longfellow's poem. Whenever I do this, there's somebody in the audience mouthing the words, because it's a very famous poem, and a lot of people know it. It's called Psalm of Life. Tell me not in mournful numbers, life is but an empty dream. For the soul is dead that slumbers, and things are not what they seem. Life is real. Life is earnest and the grave is not its goal. Dust thou art, to dust returneth, was not spoken of the soul. Not enjoyment and not sorrow is our destined end or way, but to act that each tomorrow find us farther than today. Art is long and time is fleeting, and our hearts, though stout and brave, still like muffled drums are beating funeral marches to the grave. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not dumb like driven cattle, be a hero in the strife. Trust no future, however pleasant. Let the dead past bury its dead. Act, act in the living present, heart within, and God o'erhead. Lives of great men all remind us we can make our lives sublime and departing, leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. Footprints that perhaps another, sailing o'er life's solemn main, a forlorn and shipwrecked brother, seeing, shall take heart again. Let us then be up and doing, with a heart for any fate, still achieving, still pursuing, learn to labor and to wait. Now, I love the sentiment expressed in the poem, mm. but I can't help get the feeling that Longfellow is sort of up in a pulpit preaching down and talking down to me. I don't have the sense that he's talking directly across the aisle to me. Now contrast that with the very, I think, relaxed tones of Tuck the Flowers. I went to turn the grass once, after one who mowed it in the dew before the sun. The dew was gone that made his blade so keen before I came to view the level scene. I looked for him behind an aisle of trees. I listened for his whetstone on the breeze. But he'd gone his way, the grass all mown, and I must be as he had been alone. As all must be, I said within my heart, whether they work together or apart. But as I said it, Swift there passed me by on noiseless swing a bewildered butterfly, seeking with memories grown dim o'er night some resting flower of yesterday's delight. And once I marked his flight go round and round as where some flower lay withering on the ground. And then he flew as far as I could see, and then on tremulous swing came back to me. I thought of questions that have no reply, and would have turned to toss the grass to dry, but he turned first and led my eye to look at a tall tuft of flowers beside a brook, a leaping tongue of bloom the sight had spared, beside a reedy brook the sight had bared. The mower in the dew had loved them thus by leaving them to flourish not for us, nor yet to draw one thought of ours to him, but from sheer morning gladness at the brim. The butterfly and I had lit upon, nevertheless, a message from the dawn that made me hear the wakening birds around and hear his long sight whispering to the ground. 
and feel a spirit kindred to my own, so that henceforth I work no more alone, but glad with him worked as with his aid, and weary sought at noon with him the shade, and dreaming as twere held brotherly speech with one whose thought I had not hoped to reach. Men work together. I told them from the heart whether they work together or apart. Now, I hope you can indulge me in a little bit of literary investigation or detective work here. And you can disagree with this, all right? But whenever I read a work of literature, whether it's a poem, whether it's a novel, whether it's a play, I'm always asking myself questions about the genesis of that particular work of art. How did it take place? Now, I don't know that this is the fact, all right? But my supposition goes something like this. Frost was a nocturnal man, by his own admission. He was up from 10 o'clock at night, often sometimes to 1 o'clock, writing poems. The pasture there at the dairy farm needs to be mown. It's overgrown. Ellen has been bugging him for weeks about doing it, and he keeps telling her, OK, darling, I'm going to do it. He's asleep. It's 6 o'clock, 6.30 in the morning. She's up making breakfast for the kids. And this hobo itinerant type, the type that he writes about, of course, in The Death of the Hired Man, knocks on the door and brokers a deal to mow the lawn, OK, with the scythe. Now, 9.30, 10 o'clock, Frost gets up, comes downstairs, pours himself some coffee that's left on the stove, goes, opens the door to stretch and to get some air, and he sees that the pasture is mown. All right, I think that he feels two things simultaneously. I think he feels extraordinary gratitude that it's done. I also think he feels probably guilty that he didn't do it. I think he wants to thank the man. It says in the poem, I looked for him behind an aisle of trees. I listened for his wet stone on the breeze. But he'd gone his way, the grass all mown, and I must be as he had been alone, as all must be, I said, within my heart, whether they work together or apart. Now, that's a pretty big existential statement about being alone and not feeling connected. Now, the thing I love about this poem is that it is completely cyclical, all right? It begins with that sweeping statement, and it ends with another sweeping statement. Mm -hmm. What happens that changes his whole perspective? Mm -hmm. Come on, guys, what happens? The butterfly. The butterfly. The butterfly starts flying around, and the line in the poem says, and led my eyes to look at a tall tuft of flowers beside a brook. And I love his description. He says, what? A leaping tongue of bloom the sight had spared beside a reedy brook the sight had bared. Now he says, the mower in the dew had loved them thus by leaving them to flourish not for us, nor yet to draw one thought of ours to him, but why? Sheer morning gladness at the brim. He just has this amazing experience of the beauty and majesty of nature. And so I think that that gets the narrative voice in the poem. If you want to call it Robert Frost, you can. If you want to call it the narrative voice of the poem, whatever. But that gets this person to thinking about the change. And at the end of the poem, he says, men work together, I told him at the heart, whether they work together or apart. Now, about two years ago, Harvard Belknap University Press published Frost's Notebooks, all right? And I, had a, I taught a class at the Ipswich Senior Center, and this woman bought me $50 hardcover, all right? And I was looking through it. Do you know, in the notes to this poem, and Frost made lots and lots of revisions. Now, I perform as Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman made very few revisions. He just wrote the poems, and that's basically what they were. You know, they just gushed from his pen. Frost made a lot of revisions. In the margins to the notes to this poem, there's a quote from Emerson. Frost was a big admirer of both Thoreau and Emerson. And Emerson's book called Nature, there's, a, there's, a, there's something that Frost wrote in the margins. As human beings, we all stand alone, empty, 
waiting to be full. Well, I'm going to repeat that. As human beings, we all stand alone, empty, waiting to be full. Waiting to be full of what? To be full of life, to be full of a sense of joie de vie, to be full of that awe and majesty of nature. And so this poem, where these two men never have eye contact, yet they have this shared experience of nature. Now Frost often said that certain poems of his were in dialectic one with another. And he talks about this poem, Tuft of Flowers, being in conversation with the next poem that we're going to look at, which is Mending Wall. Anybody want to comment on Tuft of Flowers before we move on? Anybody? No? Anything to say? No, okay. All right. All right. So, this next poem, Mending Wall, probably if you went upstairs and looked at literary criticism, you could probably find lots and lots written about this poem. So many critics have written about this poem. And Frost once famously said, when you read my poetry, don't make the mistake of attributing my consciousness to be one person as opposed to the other. And he talked about this poem. And he said that there were aspects of him that were something there is that doesn't love a wall, and that there were also aspects of him that were good fences make good neighbors. All right, so here we go. Something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down, that sends the frozen ground swell under it, spills the upper boulders in the sun, and makes gaps even too can pass the breast. The work of hunters is another thing. I've come after them and made repair where they've left not one stone on a stone, <coughs> but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps I mean, no one has seen them made or heard them made, but at spring mending time we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go to each the boulders that have fallen to each, and some are loaves, and some so nearly balls, we have to use a spell to make them balance. Stay where you are till our backs are turned. We wear our fingers rough with handling them. Oh, just another kind of outdoor game. One on the side comes to little more than that. There where it is we do not need the wall. He is all pine, and I am apple orchard. My apple trees will never get across and eat the cones under his pines, I tell him. He only says, good Fences make good neighbors. Spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head. Why do they make good neighbors? Isn't it where there are cows? But here there are no cows. Before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out, and to whom I was like to give offense. Something there is that doesn't love a wall. I could say elves to him, but it's not elves exactly, and I'd rather he said it for himself. I see him standing there, bringing a stone grasped firmly in each hand, like an old stone savage armed. He moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees. He will not go behind his father's saying, and he likes having thought of it so much he only says again, good fences make good neighbors. Now, in the 50s, as I told you, when Frost was doing his barding around at all these colleges, he would typically do something 75, sometimes 90 minutes. And I've had the privilege of watching some of these at the library at Harvard University. I forget the name of the library, not the Widener, but there's one that has all of the recordings of all the talks he's ever done. You should come in with me sometime, Randy, and look at them. In any event, Frost would do his reading. He would come back to the podium. He'd shuffle his papers. He would take a bow, and he'd walk out. And there'd be thunderous applause. And people would inevitably say, Robert, you didn't do my favorite poem. <laughs> and he would leave out certain poems because he knew people were going to ask for them. <laughs> that's, that's just true. I believe that. So people would invariably say, 
mending wall. And then he would laugh and say, oh, so you want my political poem, huh? And then he said, something there is that doesn't love a wall, that's the Democrat, and good fences make good neighbors, that's the Republican. Yeah. All right? Now, I think that Frost, listen, it's awfully hard to pigeonhole Robert Frost in terms of religion, philosophy, politics. You're talking about a man who was vehemently opposed to Franklin Delano Roosevelt yeah. and the New Deal. But who did he vote for twice for president? Eugene Debs. Yeah. All right? So you're talking about someone, it's awfully hard to pigeonhole him. All right? Now, I think Frost would get a big kick out of knowing that in 1963, President Kennedy read Mending Wall over there in Germany months before he was assassinated. And then Reagan read it, what, was it 1988? Before he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. All right, so, so much has been written about this poem. And, well, let's, you, what, what do you think? I, I, I don't want to just pontificate here. What's he, what, what is he provoking you to think about as a reader? What is he probing you to think about? Were the walls are really necessary? Yeah, are the walls really necessary? All right, yes, go ahead. Traditions. Traditions. The origin and purpose of tradition. The origin and purpose of tradition. Are walls really necessary? What else is he provoking us to think about? Robert Frost says that humor is always important in, in a poem. And so I think he's having a lot of fun and making us laugh. Yeah, I mean, I think, to Randy's point there about having a lot of fun and making us laugh, I think there's a gag line in the first line of the poem. He says, something there is that doesn't love a wall, that wants it down, that sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun. What is the frozen ground swell? Frost heaves. All right, now listen, I'm not making this up. When he first arrived in England, all right? England was in a cold, cold snap. Now, if you've been to England or Ireland, you know it doesn't typically get very cold. But the headline on the London Guardian Observer said, England in the grip of frost. <laughs> so, so he bought as many of those newspapers as he could afford at the moment, and he sent them all back to his friends, including John Bartlett, who was one of his best students here at Pinkerton, and he said, see, I've only been here for 48 hours and they're already under my influence. All right? So, so but I think, I think that, isn't he provoking us to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be free? Is freedom contingent upon some form of constraint or restraint? Now, the two voices you know, the one, now, his neighbor, by the way, and this is borne out by the biographies, his neighbor was a big French-Canadian man by the name of Napoleon Gouet. And he was 6'8", built like a brick shit house, excuse my language. You and said house. Ha yeah, and apparently, apparently, he and Frost did not have a lot to say to each other, <laughs> all right? But once a year, nonetheless, they got together to repair the wall, all right? Now, spring is the mischief in me. Yes, I love that. I think of leprechauns and fairies, and, you know, spring is the mischief in me, and I wonder if I could put a notion in his head, all right? Can I make this person even entertain the possibility of looking at somebody else's point of view? And by the end of the poem, the answer is pretty clearly no, all right? But getting together to mend the wall at least brings them together. We keep the wall between us as we go, all right? Now, between, language is wonderful. I could say that there's a barrier between this gentleman and I, and it happens to be this chair. But you can also say that I don't know if this is true or not, but I'll just make this up. That between us, we share a love for Shakespeare. So do you see how between can be something that is exclusive, and then if you think about it, it can be something that is inclusive. And I think that the language of this poem 
is, is very, very, it's not as straightforward as it appears to be. Now, how about he moves in darkness, as it seems to me, not of woods only in the shade of trees, all right? Now, they are moving in the literal darkness of the day. And you get the feeling that mending this wall is an all-day-long affair. But he's also talking about the darkness of his mind and this person not being able to entertain somebody else's notion, somebody else's idea. Now, I see him standing there. Think of Napoleon Gouet, six feet eight, huge, ripping muscles. I see him standing there bringing a stone grasped firmly by the top in each hand like an old stone savage arm. What does that suggest to you? Old stone savage armed? Come on, guys, what does that suggest? Uh, Neanderthal man, okay, yeah. Cro-Magnon, Australopithecus, yeah. whatever. All right? Yeah. He sees him, I think, as being very threatening. And, 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 and is this person capable of an original thought? <laughs> good fences make good neighbors, he heard from who? His father. His father probably heard it from his father. Somebody told me, I taught a class one time, and somebody told me that that term, good fences make good neighbors, that that first showed up, I don't know if this is true or not, if anybody knows, they can tell me, but it sounds like a good story, that that first showed up in the Farmer's Almanac in 1826. We have, or, we have, we have, we have, you have the Almanac in the... We have, we have an Almanac that yeah. says good fences make okay. good In the 1860s, and, and then the next... Time it was used, I think it was uh, 1908. Okay. In the Obama's office. Okay. So it was kind of All like right. a bromide at that time, huh? It was, it was kind of a bromide. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. All right. So we could talk a lot more about this poem, but I'm looking at time ticking by now. I will say this I'm here and I'll stay as long as people want to stay. If you have to, Sherry's not going to be saying, no, 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 no. no. Huh? Oh, so, oh, 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 we have that long? Okay, all right, go ahead. One quick query, I have to show my ignorance publicly here. Public I don't usually ask for explanations, reminds me of a but I could say elves to him, um, but it's not elves exactly. But is that, you were speaking of colloquialism, is, was that a particular uh, colloquialism? I could say elves to him, I don't know what he's, that I don't know exactly what well, he's Well, I think, what's, what do you think, Randy? I think he's talking about well, nymphs and fairies and... and Children and they, you know, and, and they would go out into the, you know, in, in, uh, over by the, the uh, um, Irish. Yeah, yeah, and she, he also read, the, uh, he also read uh, story books to the children. Absolutely. And, and yeah. so he would, he would be using, although this is written in England, it's written in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, when, when he writes this poem, he's thinking back, but he, he wrote this, he, he came to a drywall when he was visiting his mother's home yeah, of where his mother was born. In, in, in Scotland. Scotland, yeah. And he comes to, a, 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 at the birth of five, he, I just read this last time, that's why I remember it. Uh, he came to a, it was a, a dry, uh, what I call a dry ditch or uh, a dike that's, but it's a dry wall dike, and, uh -huh. he, and he saw the stone stack, and it reminded him, and that's when he writes. Uh -huh. He writes the mending wall. Yeah. So he's thinking back to a time, but he also has his four children with him in England. Right. So, uh, you know, and there's elves and fairies and... Right, but, but I understand what you're saying, but when he says, there is something here, when he says to this gargantuan, when, when, he, when he says, I could say elves to him, what is he really saying? Like, I, I could say that... Th yes, I could say anything. Is that basically that, what you're I think, saying? I think you're onto it. I could, I could, say, I could say anything. anything. That's, okay. I could say that's anything to him and he still wouldn't hear. Okay. He I, would still be a stone. I think that's what he's probably... Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, let's move on to Birches. Now, I want to tell you something, folks. Uh, there's a book by John Evangelista Walsh called Robert Frost, The English Years. Now, in that book, he makes the case that Birches was written, the original poem was written in Derry probably in 1906, 1907. And the fragment about the icicles and the trees and all of that was written in England probably four, three years later. Now, I and it really upsets some people, so I'm just telling you, I recite the poem without the fragment about the icicles, all right? Now, <laughs> I know. It's so beautiful. 
I, I, <laughs> Evangelista Walsh makes the point that the poem stands on its own without the icicles. But I will tell you, I did this program at Brookhaven in Lexington, where there are a lot of retired English professors from Harvard University. And oh my god, did I get the riot act read <laughs> to me by a professor who came up to me, how dare you recite that poem without including that part? And I asked him if he was familiar with the John Evangelista Walsh book, and he said, that man is a jackass. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, so here we go. <laughs> when I see birches bend to left and right across the lines of straight to darker trees, I like to think some boy's been swinging them as he went out and in to fetch the cows. Some boy too far from town to learn baseball whose only play was what he found himself summer or winter and could play alone. One by one he subdued his father's trees by riding them down over and over again till he took the stiffness out of them, and not one but hung limp, not one was left for him to conquer. He learned all there was to learn about not launching out too soon, and so not carrying the tree clear away to the ground. He always kept his poise to the top branches, climbing carefully with the same pains you use to fill a cup up to the brim, even above the brim. Then he flung outward feet first with a swish, kicking his way down through the air toward the ground. So was I once myself a swinger of birches, and so I dream of going back to be. It's when I'm weary of considerations, and life's too much like a pathless wood, where your face burns and tickles with the cobwebs broken across it, and one eye's weeping from the twigs having lashed across it open. I'd like to get away from Earth a while, and then come back to it and begin over. May no fate willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. Earth's the right place for love. I don't know where it's likely to go better. I'd like to go by climbing a birch tree and climb black branches up a snow white trunk toward heaven till the tree could bear no more but dipped its top and set me down again. That would be good both going and coming back. One could do worse than be a swinger of birches. <laughs> Robert. Are you a realist? No, I'm an actualist. I write about things that actually happened. All right? Now, we know that the Frost children were keeping journals, diaries, whatever you want to call them. In her diary, Leslie at age seven, Papa and I went out to swing on the birches today. Papa did a much better job than me. Papa says, when I have more meat on my bones, I'll be able to swing the birches as well as he. Which, by the way, just to interject here, Lawrence Thompson, those three biographies have been dubbed the monster myth by other Frost biographers. Lawrence Thompson, at every chance he gets, tries to portray Frost as a misanthrope, a misogynist, and a general all-around nasty man. And I don't think his daughter Leslie would write that lovingly about her father in a diary mm. if that was the case. Right. So in any event, Frost is probably remembering himself swinging on birch trees. And I want to tell you all, I go into middle schools occasionally and I do workshops with kids. And the thing that frightens the hell out of me, kids today don't climb trees. No, no. You try to do this poem with a... Nine, ten, eleven-year-old kid, there's like a disconnect. Yeah, only on a screen. It, it really? All right? We now, used to climb the swing birches even before I grew up in Frost. I mean, it's, yeah, it's I, remember, <laughs> I remember doing them when I was a yeah. kid for sure. All right, so, you know, poetry is basically one of two things, right? It's either simile, you remember from middle school English, a simile is a direct comparison using either like or as or a metaphor is an implied comparison. 
All right? So there's a lot of implied comparisons taking place here in this poem. Metaphorically speaking, what are some of the things swinging on the birches denote or represent? Come on, guys. A short vacation from reality? A short vacation from reality? <laughs> uh, a, Soma, a Soma holiday, as uh, Aldous Huxley would say in Brave New World. Go ahead. Heaven and Earth. Yeah, heaven and Earth. All right, it, we, can you want to expound on that more? Well, just, just at the get there, very end, you know, it's, it, they always talk about um, uh, stopping by the woods in the snow and evening as dealing with death. Right. But I think that his talking about heaven and earth is, is a, you know, is uh, a little bit of that, of, okay. of, you know, of, of, uh, of, of coming up and then coming and down. And then coming down. Going, going up, 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 and then gravity eventually pulls you back down, 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 down. So, is it, go ahead. Mood swings. Mood swings. Is it a yes, yeah, no, listen. That's true. Listen, and, and mood swings, listen. Yeah. Frost, Absolutely. Frost admitted to close friends and some biographers that he was dealing his whole life with his own depression. Yeah. And he said the way that he kept his depression at bay was by working. So certainly I think he's talking about mood swings. Now, when he says in the poem, now, he, you talked about death imagery. There's a critic, I'm not going to mention her name, but she's very, of course, impressed with herself. And she has written this, this, this whole essay about the death imagery in Robert Frost's poetry. And she uses this poem as an example. And I think that she's totally off base. He says, I'd like to get away from Earth a while. What's the very next line? <laughs> and then come back to it and yes. begin over. Right. Now, in case you still want to go with this death imagery, mm -hmm. he says, may no fate Will willfully misunderstand me and half grant what I wish and snatch me away not to return. You can't go halfway to death. I mean, there are people that have had near-death experiences, falling off cliffs while they're technically climbing, and they describe going into this white tunnel of light, but I don't think the poem is a death poem at all. But I do think that he's dealing with, he says, it's when, when does he want to get away from it all? He says, it's when I'm weary of considerations. Mm. And life is too much like a pathless wood. And I wish I could tell you that I was the person that pointed this out, but I think this might have been Heaney, I I'm not sure. But somebody talks about echoes of Dante there, that, you know, in the Inferno, it was the middle of my life and I found myself in a deep, dark wood, yeah. and I was lost, yeah. all right? So some of, the, some of the considerations in the life of Robert Frost, the weary considerations, the death of his three-year-old, Elliot, the death of his wife, the suicide of his son, the death of his daughter, and the, the being in an asylum of his daughter, Irma, and also of his sister, Jean. So lots and lots of weary considerations. And his mother passes on as well. Yeah, and, 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 and several months after they moved to Derry, his mother passes on up in Pentecost. So yeah. But, but, but I think you, what, what you, I mean, mood swings, balance, balance, the yin and the yang. You know, it, well, we're going to get to that poem a little he does, later. So. He does say that poetry uh, provided, made order out of chaos. Yes. And, and I think that... I think that's why he loves writing poetry, too, is it, it provides him with some kind of order. Yeah, order out of chaos. That reminds me of, there's a wonderful sonnet by Edna St. Vincent Millay, mm -hmm. and the first line of the sonnet is, I will put chaos into 14 lines and keep him there. <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful sonnet, and you should, ch I teach a class on Edna St. Really? Vincent Millay as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, go ahead, ma'am. Be a child for a, for a moment. Well, that's the other, yes, yeah. The, I'm glad that, I almost forgot, I'm glad she brought that up. At the end of the poem, he says, I'd like to go by swing, to go where? I don't think he's talking about going to heaven. I think he's talking about, I'd like to go through my journey of life. I'd like to go by swinging a bird's tree. And for me, the way I read that line is, I'd like to go through life with a sense of youthful exuberance and be able to have awe and wonder the way that kids are. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's how I read it. Anybody else have a different reading? 
I mean, listen, I want to, I tell people the reason I love literature so much is because you can have a completely different opinion from somebody else. And believe me, when I teach classes, a lot of people disagree with me a lot. And I learn. I mean, that's how you learn. Go ahead, sir. I, talking about, about Frost's life and personal experiences and tragedies makes me think of Mark Twain. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah and I wonder, did you know. Frost have any commentary, anything that reflected his um, observations about Mark Twain's life that you know of? Do you know? I don't know. Uh, he was a big devotee of, of uh, Mark Twain. Well, okay. He read him constantly. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, okay. Punch Boy Punch was, was probably his favorite shot. His okay. Story. How okay. something would come into you and stay with you and you couldn't get rid of it. Okay. Okay. I do know from the biographies there's a very funny line. I know you're going to be familiar with this line. But they asked Frost one time what he thought of free verse and what he thought of Walt Whitman's poetry, which is free verse. And you know what his, his retort was. He said, I think writing free verse poetry would be like playing tennis without the net. <laughs> a, playing tennis without the net. It's a great line. Great line. Um, so, so uh, anybody else have a comment on Birch's? All right. Let me take a sip of water, and let's move on to after apple picking. My long, two-pointed ladder is sticking through a tree toward heaven still, and there's a barrel I didn't fill beside it. And there may be two, three apples I didn't pick upon some bough. But I'm done with apple picking now. Essence of winter sleep is on the night. The scent of apples I'm drowsing off. I cannot rub the strangeness from my sight. I got from looking through a pane of glass. I skimmed this morning from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted. And I let it fall and break, but I was well upon my way to sleep when it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. Magnified apples appear and disappear, stem end and blossom end, and every fleck of russet showing clear. My instep arch not only keeps the ache, it keeps the pressure of a ladder round. I feel the ladder sway as the boughs bend, and I keep hearing from the cellar bin the rumbling sound of load and load of apples coming in, for I have had too much of apple picking. I am overtired of the great harvest I myself once desired. There were 10,000 thousand fruit to touch, Cherish in hand, lift down, and not let fall. For all that struck the earth, no matter if not bruised or spiked with stubble, went surely to the cider apple heap as of no worth. One can tell what will trouble this sleep of mine, whatever sleep it is. Were he not gone, the woodchuck could say whether it's like his long sleep, as I describe it's coming on, or just some human sleep. I love this poem. This is one it's of my really nice, yeah. this is one of my favorite. Mm -hmm. I mean there's so many favorites. Mm -hmm. I, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I teach a class on Yeats as well and I just I mean how do you pick favorites with Yeats or with Frost for that matter? Alright so after apple picking. Alright so on a simple level, the poem is about picking apples. Mm. Once again, like with the birches, metaphorically speaking, what does the picking of the apples, what, what, what's he talking about here? The mundane. Come on, you guys. The mundane. Huh? The mundane of like picking, picking. It's just monotonous. Okay, he says the, min the minutia of life, the, mun the, the mundane, how things get monotonous. Anybody else? What's he talking about? Yeah. Uh, he's getting older in his years. Yeah, I, well, that's a good, listen, 
Whenever you read a poem, and this is a question, I took a workshop with a young, uh, well, not that young, she's in her mid-40s, but there's a, a poet named uh, Sophie Wadsworth, and she lives in the Harvard, Massachusetts area, and uh, she's written a couple of books of poetry, and seven or eight years ago, maybe ten years ago, I took a workshop with her, and she said, whenever you read a poem, you need to ask yourself this question, who's telling you the story, All right? Who is telling you the story? So in this poem, who's telling you the story? Is it a young man, an adolescent boy, a middle-aged man, an old man, a very old man? Who's telling you the story? Mature. Mature, you say? Anybody else have a thought as to who's telling the story? I think, I think, I think it's a pretty old man. And I think, we, I think we get some hints from that right from the text. Oh, yeah. The feet, uh, yeah. The, I yeah. <laughs> rubbed the strangeness from my sight. I got from looking through a pane of glass. I skimmed, when? This morning, from the drinking trough and held against the world of hoary grass. It melted the ice, and I let it fall and break, but I was well upon my way to sleep when it fell, and I could tell what form my dreaming was about to take. So he's telling you that he's well upon his way to sleep early in the morning. Mm. Now, if it's a middle-aged man, early in the morning, he's in a traffic jam going to work. All right? So, I mean, I think that there's some hints to the poem that this is an older man. Yeah. Now, the, 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 he, the line says, and there may be two, three apples I didn't pick upon some bough, but I'm done with apple picking now. That tells you that he's... he's I think there's a qualitative difference between saying that you're finished with something and saying that you're done. If you say you're finished with something, I think it indicates you're finished with a particular task and maybe you take it up again. For me, saying that you're done, there's a sense of finality about that. So I think that this is a man looking back at his life. And I think he's looking back at what it is he has brought to fruition what it is he's harvested in his life. No, go ahead, Randy. Frost is very seasonal. He talks a lot about the various months and the various seasons of the year. In fact, we sell a book from there that deals with the four seasons of Robert Frost. And this is this could be about winter coming on too. Yes, yeah. yeah. that's what I. It's the essence of winter sleep changes seasons. Yeah. I, mean, I can right, see yeah. the part about getting older, but mm -hmm. I was. I, he's very seasonal. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so it could be. It could that too, uh, you know, the whole idea of, 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 of winter coming on, I'm done. Yeah. Done. Well, I'm overtired. He doesn't just say he's tired. He says he's overtired of the great harvest I myself once desired. Now, he says there were 10,000 thousand fruit. I'm not a mathematician, but that's a hell of a big number. There were 10,000 thousand fruit to cherish in hand lift down and not let fall, all right? And so, I think... You don't think that's hyperbole? Well, <laughs> well, it's you hyperbole, it's hyperbole, <laughs> it's hyperbole, but one of the ways I read this poem is that this is an elderly man <clears throat> looking back at his life. I don't think he's in despair. I don't think he's in necessary distress. I think he's looking back, and I think that there's a... If there's an acknowledgement as to what it is he's accomplished in his life. But I also think that there's, that there's a looking at what he didn't accomplish. Yes. And, it, and it, it reminds me, in that way, I'm always cross-referencing, but this reminds me, in some way, to Shakespeare's Sonnet 30. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. And with old woes, new wail, my dear times waste. All right? So I think this person is looking and saying, well, you know, I'm, I feel pretty good. I've accomplished this, 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 and that. But there are some things I wish that I did accomplish. Go ahead, sir. Made me think of a, perhaps a retired teacher or someone in a profession <laughs> of poetry uh -huh. who was looking to see if his words were understood or if his message got across tens right. of thousands of people reading his poems right, right. in his classes. Uh -huh. 
Well, I think of that movie, Mr. Holland's Opus. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, that's a great movie. And here's this musician who's going to take this job for just a couple of years because he's not getting enough gigs. And all of a sudden, 35 years have gone by, and he's had this extraordinary career. And at the end of his career, he still is looking back to the famous musician that he wanted to be that he never became. Now, the sense I get from that movie is he's got great pride as to what he's accomplished. Mm. But he, he still looks back wistfully, nostalgically, at what he wanted to do but didn't accomplish. Right, right. That's and, and that's what I read between the lines of this poem. Yeah. And I think that, go ahead, ma'am. I felt that, like you said, this could be a metaphor for work or for life. Mm -hmm. But it was definitely, this is what I wrote for a note. OK, go ahead. Whenever the point of exhaustion is reached in any given form of work, a sense of tired numbness overrides our common sense line of thinking in favor of sleep, or in life, probably rest. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, ladders are left against the tree, a barrel sits empty, no signs of harvest within its rim, and two or three rogue apples are given a stay of execution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it just, that's what I got out of it, Will. You can be painting a room, and you probably only have one more foot to go, but, but you're there just is exhausted something and you're, within yeah. the nature oh. where you'll leave your brush to dry, you'll, yeah. you won't do the normal things that you do. There is, he's talking about a point of exhaustion <laughs> that all human nature reaches in this case, it's done by the apple picker, mm -hmm. but you can apply it to everyone here knows the many yeah, times the line that reached that point. The rumbling sound of load on load of yeah. apples coming in, but I have had too much of apple picking. Mm -hmm. And that's when he says, I'm overtired of the great harvest I myself once desired. Now, what is the great harvest? What is the great harvest? I mean, for the narrative voice in the poem, it's one thing. For you reading the poem, it's something else. I think there's a term that the sociologists actually use, and you've probably heard this term. Any sociology people here? There's a term called the laws of diminishing returns. No, that's actually a term, a sociological term. And listen, when we are all 19, 20, 21, 22 years old, we all have visions about how our life is going to be, don't we? And then, of course, you get to the middle of your life and you start looking at what you've done and what you wanted to do and you start to think, well, maybe I'm not going to write that next great American novel that I thought I was going to write or maybe I'm not going to find the cure for cancer. And you start reevaluating. Yeah. Now, I get a sense, I, I think this is a very positive poem. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very positive affirmation of what it is that he's brought to fruition. With, with, with the recognition, and I think of that sonnet by Shakespeare, I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought. And we all sigh the lack of things we sought, don't we? Yes, sir. Okay, and I also look at Frost as naturalist. Yes, of course. He had 100 apple trees, and only one year did he pick his own apples. <laughs> <laughs> that one year, he that put them in the barrels, took them to the depot down here on Broadway, and actually lost money on the whole proposition. <laughs> so every year afterwards, he would sell the apples on the tree, and gangs would come in and just pay him a few dollars. And he did. He was done with apple. He picking. was really done with apple. He picking. was done with apple picking. Okay, go ahead, Randy. Uh, we have a. Do you have a? If you come up to the Frost Bar in summer, we have a uh, a film called Voices and Visions, and and, and other poets talk about Frost and Shantini talks about this particular poem, Apple Picking, and he, he reads it and then talks about how he envies Frost. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that, that he, he just loves the whole idea of the ladder pointed towards heaven. And, the, and talking about an actualist, because I grew up in apple country, and right. I know about picking apples. Uh, my instep box not only keeps the ache. Yeah. yeah. If you've ever been on a ladder yeah. for more than 45 oh, minutes, yes, forms. oh my God, you it's know. A, it's a wooden ladder that gives. Yeah. As you, as you right. right, and it forms so, the. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, 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 so she started with Shemesini, and, and he did. And, 
He did say that he wished he could have given his Nobel Prize to Robert Frost. Huh. He did say that. Interesting. So, but, but Frost he, certainly he, wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> he lobbied for it. He did. <laughs> he deserved it. He did deserve it. He did deserve it. This yes, sir. This sounds more of a lament to me, honestly, though. I mean, I, I don't... Uh, it, 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 clearly, I'm seeing more and more, because I, I hadn't read it that many times, honestly, before. Uh, it, it, it's clearly about, it, it, to me, uh, all that might have been, and wearying, of, and uh, among many other things. But it still sounds overall like more of a lament. Okay. I, I don't see it as too, um, too praiseworthy. Of, of the, uh, I don't see him patting himself on the back here. I see it mostly as a lament. Okay. So okay. Where he hints at that haunting of um, some of the good apples. Well, now let's talk about in the, as in of no let's worth. talk about that for a second. No worth, yeah. That line in the poem yeah. is is I think that's a very because if we're talking about what one brings to fruition in one's life. So I taught this class one time at a senior center uh, called LaSalle Village, and this woman said that line really bothers me <laughs> about uh, the apple. Uh, as of having no worth going to the cider, the cider apple heap. Yeah. And she said, you're talking about what people bring to fruition. So she said, she said, look, not every apple is going to be part of my prize-winning apple pie. She said, some of the apples are going to go to make cider. But she said, I happen to think cider is a wonderful drink. Yeah, it is. And so she said, why does he say as of no worth? Because cider is a worthwhile drink. And I really, I thought about it for a second, and I thought, well, you know, what is, what, so is he saying here that, that, that different things come to be? Not, not everything gets to be maybe what you wanted it to be. Huh? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't think he's saying that the cider, that the apples that fell on the ground are worthless. He's kind of saying that they're regarded as They're regarded a, as, as worthless, yeah. but they yeah. still... Right. But they yes, because there right. was a certain number of them right. that struck the ground but did not get bruised or, or spiked with stubble. stubble. Exactly. But they were still seen as having no worth. And he says, "I can see now what's going to trouble me in my sleep." Right. That that's where the right. land is having no worth. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, he knew the story of his neighbor Napoleon Getty, um, who also had apple trees. And he didn't just have pine trees. And uh, Napoleon had a habit of putting his apples into barrels, and then taking them down to the depot to sell them to the merchants from Boston. And they would, re every year, they would reject his apples because he had put the best apples on top and filled the rest of the barrels with apples no better than for cider. And so they could smell the cider. And he'd have to take it back, and then he'd re-stamp it. And he kept on doing that two or three times each year and finally, the apples all were no good. They had all turned rotten. Okay, all right. So he knew that story. story. He told that. Oh, you gotta go. Okay, thank you for being here. So much. Thanks. Thanks. He told that story in Derry in 1951. Okay. Uh, Listen, folks, we're gonna run out of time, and I want to do these two short poems okay. because there's a nice story that goes along with them, which I'm probably sure you're familiar with. So Robert Frost celebrated his 80th birthday on March 24. 26, excuse me, March 26, 1954, at the exclusive Harvard Club of Boston. Now, there was a committee that was set up to plan this gala event. And one of the people on the committee was Louis Untermeyer, who was a very good friend of Robert Frost, and who some of you probably have anthologies of poetry sitting at home on your shelf that were anthologized by Untermeyer. He was a minor poet, not a very good poet, all things considered, um, but he was a dear, dear friend of Frost, and he was on this committee. Now, he was in Europe on a honeymoon. Untermeyer was married to his first wife and divorced. Married to his second wife and divorced. He eventually remarried the first wife and was taking her on a second honeymoon over to Europe. And Frost teased the hell out of him and told him he could have saved himself a lot of <laughs> aggravation and money had he just stayed with wife number one. <laughs> but in any event, Untermeyer was over there in Europe, all right? 
and the master of ceremonies for this gala event had still not been chosen. Somebody actually suggested that Richard Nixon, I'm not making this up, it's in the biographies, that Richard Nixon would be the master of ceremonies. And Untermeyer, who was a Jew and who was also extraordinarily liberal, he immediately sent a telegram back and said, under no circumstances is Richard Nixon to be the master of ceremonies. So the great Columbia professor Lionel Trilling was approached. And Lionel Trilling said, look, I've read Robert Frost's poetry, but I can't say that I'm a student of his poetry or an expert, and I'm not sure that I'm the person to do this. And they begged him and said, look, we're running out of time. You've got six, seven weeks. Can you please just read his poetry for a couple of weeks and just have a few nice things to say about Robert Frost? <laughs> so Lionel Trilling read the poetry, and he stood in front of 2,000 people in front of the Harvard Club in Boston, and he looked out at the assembled audience, and he said, I have made a study these past six weeks of the poetry of Robert Frost. And he said, I'm not sure that my experience of Robert Frost is going to coincide with the experience of some of you in the audience. And then he said, I find Robert Frost to be a poet of terrifying Sophoclean proportion." I find him to be a poet of terrifying Sophoclean proportion. And then he recited from memory these two poems. All right, so the first one is called Desert Places, and the second one is called Acquainted with the Night. Desert Places. Snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast, in a field I looked into going past and the ground almost covered smooth in snow, but a few weeds and stubble showing last. The woods around it have it. It is theirs. All animals are smothered in their layers. I am too absent-spirited to count. The loneliness includes me unawares. And lonely as it is, that loneliness will be more lonely ere it will be less. A blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, nothing to express. They cannot scare me with their empty spaces between stars on stars where no human race is. I have it in me so much nearer home to scare myself with my mm. own desert places. Wow. Wow, that is something powerful. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows the poem The Snowman by Wallace Stevens. <coughs> but for my my taste. I think this poem of Robert Frost is infinitely more terrifying than Wallace Stevens' poem. Now, the great Catholic theologian Blaise Pascal, Pascal once said that looking up at the vast interstellar darkness between the stars was absolutely terrifying. He said that even trying to contemplate or think about infinity was absolutely terrifying. Now, what does Frost say in this poem? He says, never mind contemplating that. Try to contemplate and live in this. This is more terrifying. Now, when he says they cannot scare me, who's they? Who's they? The learned, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, would, you, would you just say theologian? Yeah, I mean, I think you said the learned. They, I think, are the experts. Yes. The astronomers, the the uh, the scientists, the theologians, the politicians, whoever. They cannot scare me 
with their empty spaces between stars on stars where no human race is. Now, there's another thing about this poem that is very ambiguous, all right? And that is this. Snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast, in a field I looked into going past. I, I love the wonderful staccato rhythm and the monosyllabic words, boom, 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 boom. It's like you're being bombarded. Now, uh, uh, night, uh, snow falling and night falling fast, oh fast, in a field I looked into going past, and the ground almost covered smooth and snow, and a few leaves and stubble showing last. All right, here it is. I can't just pull things, I have to do the whole poem, I can't take it out of context. Yeah, what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> the woods around it. All right? It is what? What, what? what kind of, you know, what is it? I thought it was the field. No, no, but what, what, what you know, noun, verb, pronoun, what is it? It is a personal pronoun. All right? It is a personal pronoun. Pronouns have what? Antecedents. All right? I challenge anybody here in the room to tell me what the antecedent of it is. The woods around it have it. It is theirs. What the hell is it? Is it? Is it? Well, I don't know. I, do you think it's clear? Is it the fields? Is it the loneliness? Is it the sense of desolation? It's not clear. It is not clear. The woods around it have it. It is theirs. All animals are smothered in their lairs. Now, his. The library closes at 8.30 this evening. It is now 8 o'clock. All books and materials should be checked out by 20 minutes past 8. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> they, they said that Clara Bowl had it. That was it. Yeah, that was but, it, girl. <laughs> um, I think it is. Now, I, I am too absent spirited to count. The loneliness includes me unawares. I am too absent spirited to count. So now once again, let's look at that. And there's different theories here, okay? Is he saying that he's too out of it, that he's not even a blip on the radar, that he's not registering, so he's not counting? Or is it I'm too absent spirited to count, to make a count? One, two, three, four, five, six. In any event, he says, the loneliness includes me unawares. Well, who's unaware? He's unaware of his emotional state, isn't he? The loneliness includes me unawares. Now, and lonely as it is, that loneliness will what? Will be more lonely ere it will be less. And then this description, a blanker whiteness of benighted snow with no expression, no thing, nothing to express. It's pretty bloody scary, I think. Go up to the frost farm in the winter time and see the woods around it. And I get I get scared sometimes. <laughs> I, they're, they're cutting the woods back, right. so to speak. But those woods are coming in surrounding that field. Yeah, he's got that wonderful poem where he describes uh, the snow falling down and wondering if they're going to make it through the night. Where he's, he's stoking the well, fire. It's so, it's, uh, what is it? Storm fear. Storm, yes, mm -hmm. st storm fear. Right, exactly. So is this written uh, on when he's living at the farm, or is it? In no, this is after. It's, it's in the first it's range. Old. It's in, it's okay. in the old. But um, there's at least one poem in every book he's ever written because he works in notebooks. Okay. And, uh, and so right, it, right. It could be, and when right. he talks about the field, it is surrounded by wood. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Frost says all of his poems are dairy poems. Okay. Did he say that? Yeah, he said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's move on because I want to finish, finish up here and I want to do Acquainted with the Night. I love Acquainted with the Night as well. All right, so I have been one acquainted with the night. I've walked out in rain and back in rain. I've outwalked the furthest city light. I've looked down the saddest city lane. I've passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes unwilling to explain. I've stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street, but not to call me back or say goodbye. 
and further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. I have been one acquainted with the night. Mm. All right, so we can talk. The night in poetry is often a harbinger <coughs> of death. It is often, too, a harbinger, I think, of, of, uh, of you know, we have our shadow self, our shadow side. We, have, we all have different parts of us. I've been one acquainted with the night. I mean, I would go so far as to suggest that this, that this poem, I think, prefigures the confessional poetry of people like Sylvia Plath and Robert Lowell. He's letting you into his space. He's saying, I've been one acquainted with the night. Now, I've walked out in rain and back in rain. I've out walked the furthest city light. I passed by the watchman on his beat. Who's the watchman on his beat? Come on, who's the watchman? A policeman. All right? Now, there are no watchmen on their beats anymore. They're all in their cars with their computers. But when I was raising hell in Harvard Square in 1969 and 1970, there were two or three policemen on the beat. So he says, I dropped my eyes unwilling, unwilling to explain. So he doesn't want to make eye contact with the policeman because I'm going to suggest that probably he's been crying. Probably his eyes are teary and red and he doesn't want to open up the possibility of communication. I've dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. I stood still and stopped the sound of feet. Now what stood still? Is he trying to compose himself? Is he trying to have a meditative moment, get, get quiet, get still? I've stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. But he says, but not to call me back. It's not somebody saying, oh, it's raining out, it's dark, don't go out now but not to call me back or say goodbye. And, and somebody in a class I taught suggested that the, the noise from the street might be something as sinister as, as domestic violence. Um, now, the luminary clock against the sky is what? <laughs> the moon. The moon, all right? Now, the moon waxes and wanes. It ebbs and flows. It comes and goes, all right? One luminary clock against the sky proclaimed... That's a pretty big word. Proclaimed, the time was neither wrong nor right. The time was neither wrong nor right for what? I'm going to suggest for anything. The time is never wrong or right. Time doesn't give a good goddamn whether you're happy or sad. Time just marches on yeah. inexorably. Yeah. And so when he says that the, the, it proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right, I think that that is a pretty amazing statement. And then I love how the poem begins and ends with the first line. I've been one acquainted with the night. And I'm not, you know, when, when is it further range? What was the year that was written, Randy? Do you know? Well, I can check it out. I have a chronology there. I'm just wondering if this was written... This one was in West Running Book, Acquainted with the Night. And when's West Running Book published? 28? 1928. Oh, okay, okay. So it's way, way before. Yeah, it's supposed to be about Plymouth, New Hampshire. Okay. Now, it's now, Bill believes, this is our farm manager, he believes that Acquainted with the Night is about Lawrence, Massachusetts, where, where Rob went to school and certainly would have walked in the night. And the luminary clock Fox, was up yeah. on the mill where his grandfather was. The and owner. other people think that he he wrote this in England and that that's been bad. Many so places. Yeah. Right. So right. So right. Right. I was wondering that too. Too. About What's that? I was sure. wondering that too. The big bad and the big light. With the luminary, I assume it was the moon. Yeah. But. We, you know, Big Ben is so tall. Do uh -huh. you think this is a specific place or just evocative of a number of nights through which he has walked? Yeah, I think it's evocative of a number of nights through which he has walked. I think it's definitely about Derry, though. <laughs> <laughs> you stick with Derry. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. As you're, as you're um, reading through his poems, uh, should we always be, as we read through his poems, in your 
experience. Should we always be looking for where he was when he wrote, or should we always should we be thinking about every all his well, poems he, are, are autobiographical? Well, well, the question is, should we be thinking about his? No. Uh, listen, if you read biographies, then you know probably more than you really should know or need to know. I mean, there's a whole school of thought that says that you just look at the text, whether it's a novel, a poem, or a play, and you don't pay attention to any of that other stuff. Right. But I think, I mean, I love to read biographies sure. because it informs my reading of the poems. Yes. I mean, it just does. And I don't, I don't believe you can separate the poem from the author. I, I just don't believe you can do that. But whether or not, but, but once you give a poem to the world, it becomes the world's poem. And you can take it and use it any way you want. And, yeah. and, and, and that's, that's well, how I feel about, uh -huh. about Frost. It's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, I, I thought it was, uh, my favorite poem in high school was Fire and Ice. Uh, it was in the 50s, uh, heavy, heavy. Uh, atomic fear, uh, in, you know, and 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 people bomb shelters, bomb shelters, and, <laughs> and you know, and and uh, I said, ah, oh, a modern poem. <laughs> you, you know, fire. You know. I do. I don't know it by heart, though. Well, I, I do. I know it. So I'm going to say it. Go ahead. Go ahead. It really, uh, it's the one poem that I've memorized because it's short. <laughs> <Let's hear> it. <laughs> and I have a difficult time with it. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. Of what I tasted of desire. I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great and would suffice. <laughs> <laughs> and would suffice. And would suffice. You could just, and would suffice. You can see Frost just penning I love that line. I love it. And smiling. I love it. And, 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 and so, uh, and then I discovered this year that it was written in 1918, probably after his dearest friend, Edward Thomas, died in Arles, France, yes. uh, Arles, France from a compression bomb. Yes. Uh, so uh, I think, uh, I uh, but, but I think that Thomas, I think he wrote this because I think Thomas would have laughed at it. It's such a wonderful poem. It but it, it's, it, and it's so right for the celebration of World War I. In fact, I, was, I substituted mm, it for the Academy and I gave that. I said, this is, this is a poem by Robert. I always invite them to come up. Do you know, in every class I ever substitute, only about four or five students ever say, I've been to the Frost Farm. And mm -hmm. about half of them have never been on the tour. And it's free to children between the ages of 6 and 17. Um, but, you know, and, yeah, they just, don't, they just don't come up. All right, I'm just conscious of the time. Sorry. Sorry. So I, wanna, I just want to end. Um, you don't have these poems in your lap. Wait, the time is neither right. <laughs> <laughs> the time is neither wrong nor right. <laughs> um, so I'd like to end with two poems. One is, um, you know, about the size of these last two, and it's what I call Robert Frost's Buddhist poem, although I'm sure that Robert Frost would, of course, you know, get very angry at me and say, how dare you call this my Buddhist poem. But I love this poem. And I also have a theory that uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney um, were influenced by this poem. It's called Acceptance. When the spent sun throws up its rays on cloud and goes down burning into the gulf below, no voice in nature is heard to cry aloud at what has happened. Birds, at least, must know it is the change to darkness in the sky. Murmuring something quiet in her breast, one bird begins to close a faded eye, or overtaken too far from his nest, hurrying low above the grove, some waif swoops just in time to his remembered tree. At most, he thinks or twitters softly, now let the night be dark for all of me. Let the night be too dark for me to see into the future. Let what will be, be. <laughs> and I think let it be. <laughs> I swear let it be comes from that poem. <laughs> it's, it's very similar. Yeah. That's, yeah. Now, so That's let's end with a two-line poem of Robert Frost, which hopefully will send us off with smiles on our face. And I know you know this one, Randy, and as, as, uh, you, a, a lot of you probably know it. Forgive, O Lord, my little jokes on thee, and I'll forgive thy great big one on me. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm coming back here, right? Yes. Sounds good.
we're looking at the possibility of bringing Stephen back in the spring sometime, but it, it's contingent on whether or not I can work a grant with the Humanities Council. But we're working on it. But if I come back, I'll do probably my Walt Whitman show. Sign him up. Yeah. And then we'll go to the Coliseum here. Just for well, <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good. An evaluation form, and I'm afraid the room has to be completely emptied by 25 past. Thank you. I got to sit down. It was a pleasure, though. Thank you. I didn't even, I, I still don't know who was behind me. No, I love that. I'll find my life. Uh, <laughs> you can do that one now.